You were praying, man, Winslow. Not as often as I might, but I'm God-fearing, if that's what you're asking. If we ask people of faith about their faith, then more often than not, we end up in a, a rich, deep, insightful conversation. If we ask people of faith about their prayer life, then it's not uncommon that we'll get the sort of response like we just had in the film, a kind of, not as often as I might, not as much as I'd like, not as often as I think I should. And it's as if there's clearly like a desire and, and, and a willingness to pray, but it's as if as that desire and that willingness come up, it's like this reluctance or this hesitation immediately come in over the top and, and stifle it. And sometimes, you know, kill it dead. And talking to people, that sense of, of stifled desire to pray is something that, that's not just in the moment, that that can go on for like months or even in some people's cases like years. Now, if, if, if these observations in any way describe you, then, you know, firstly, you know, please don't be alarmed, don't be troubled. You, you know, you're very much not alone. In fact, um, I even, when even I ask members of the clergy, um, and, and you could argue that's their job, when I ask members of the clergy about their prayer life, I'll often get the same kind of response, a sort of not as often as I might, not as much as I'd like, not as often as I think I should. What? <laughs> And obviously with this, we're not talking about the sort of regular routine prayers, the weekly prayers, the prayers of like ceremonies or, or, or rituals. We're not trying to describe the sort of memorized, regurgitated prayers. But rather, I want to talk about the type of prayer that Christ describes in the Gospels, the one-on-one the -on -one coming together, the seeking communion with God, the seeking connection, the seeking to further your relationship with God very much that the prayer that comes from the heart the private intimate prayer as christ said in the gospels you know when you pray go into your room and close the door and pray to your father who is unseen and that word you know go into your room is also translated go into your closet and it's the in the greek the word is tamion and it could just as easily be translated as inner chamber or secret chamber now hold on to that phrase for a moment because we're going to come back to that phrase in a bit. And I actually believe that, that a little bit prior to Christ's day, that, that word could also be translated as like treasury, like stronghold. And so the sense is that you're going into this, this inner chamber where there's nobody can look in and you can't be seen from the outside. It's very much a, um, you know, you wouldn't be doing it for show because nobody could see very much a private personal intimate prayer and so what I, what I want to do with this series of films is I want to look at that reluctance and that hesitation that in some people seems to even manifest as a, as a kind of shyness and I've definitely heard people describe it as almost a shame like they, they feel a sense of shame and what we're going to do is we're going to use often unregarded parts of scripture to overcome that reluctance, overcome that hesitation that will profoundly help us get back into prayer. That take that reluctance and pray nonetheless. That takes that hesitation and prays in spite of it. And what I'm hoping to do is take, you know, return prayer life from this sort of over here ancillary part of faith and and you know, re bring it back into this this central theme of faith, where where faith and prayer life run in parallel, where they they're side by side, or or, or even where faith and prayer life are a kind of intertwined, that they, they they work together. You know, where where prayer life becomes a central pillar, one of the pillars of faith. Because 
my understanding is Christ in his mission, one of the parts of his mission was that he, he remade or made anew a covenant that that gave regave humanity direct access or the ability to approach God directly. Prior to the, the veil in front of the Holy of Holies, the, the, the veil in front of the inner chamber being torn in two, then it was only the Le Levitical priesthood who could go into the Holy of Holies, the secret chamber. And in fact, it was only the high priest, and that was only once a year. And so Christ, in, in remaking the covenant or making anew the covenant, he he took humanity back to the time pre-Genesis 3, back to the Edenic days, where mankind had the, the right, the entitlement, the privilege to approach God direct. Christ, in doing so, made us all priests, that we all inherited the, the ability to approach God direct. And that, that right and that entitlement to, to go into, be in God's presence directly, I want to, with this series, I want to take that entitlement and that privilege that, that, that we were given and elevate it into the realm of not just a right, but a responsibility, that it's something we, we ache to do. You know, as Christ said um, in the Gospels, if, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, if anyone, if anyone desires to come after me, let them set themselves aside and pick up their burden, pick up their responsibility and go to it. And that's what I want to do in this series of films. I want to look at the parts of scripture that will enable, re-enable that, the, the, the strong use of that kind of prayer life. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at bits of scripture we're going to find in looking there's there's a lot of scripture where we get the sense certainly in the in the in the hebrew bible so the old testament or the tanakh the the what christ would have called the law and the prophets you know the torah the prophets and the wisdom books what we'll see in that is that is that there seems to be this pattern that that actually god throughout the old testament throughout the hebrew bible is imploring us to pray is imploring us back into his presence. There's, it's like there's a yearning running through the narrative, the stories. There's this yearning from God that, that God, God wants us back. The whole of that testament, that whole of that covenant seems to be God wants us back. And that's what we're going to explore in how to, to, to get back into that with prayer, using prayer. Now, before we go and find the bits of scripture we're going to use, I want to first put this in some, some very important context. Christ, in the Gospels, is recorded that he, he talks about prayer a lot. But actually, one of the clues, I think, one of the clues to, to the way that we can apply prayer is actually given to us from the Apostles. And so the first place we're going to look is Luke 11. Now, I think most people are going to go, well, Luke 11, I'm going to hang on a minute, that's the Lord's Prayer. The beginning of Luke 11 is, 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 is one of the places we find the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, we said that we weren't going to talk about the, the memorized routine prayers, the weekly passages of, of prayer of Scripture. And it's estimated that two billion people worldwide have memorized that one piece of Scripture, that it's the most memorable, memorized piece of Scripture in, in humanity. But I don't want to look at the Lord's Prayer. I want to look just before it. There's, there's one verse, one line just before it. It's so easy to overlook. It's so easy to skip over. And it's Luke 11, 1. It's the verse immediately before the Lord's Prayer. And my understanding is that that Christ and the apostles, are that they're away from the multitudes. They're, they're sort of off on their own. And Christ in this moment, he, he's away from the apostles. So he's off by himself praying. And when he finishes, the apostles pro approach him. And they say, you know, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, Lord, teach us to pray. And that 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 
that's so easy. That verse is so easy to overlook because it takes us into the Lord's Prayer. But I want to pause at that moment. And firstly, look at it from, from their point of view. These are these are what we know is these are first century Jews, these are Hebrews, these are these are people of the tribes of Israel. And let's assume for a moment that these the, the apostles were relatively decent, relatively law-abiding, rel- relatively conscientious, relatively traditional Jews. Now, m- maybe that's a bit of a leap of faith, and we know that, that one certainly wasn't in the end. Um, so it's hard to say whether they were, were good Jewish men, um, except we know of one who was. Christ himself said of Nathaniel in the first chapter of John, here is a true Israelite, you will find in him nothing false, or you will find no deceit in him. And so Nathaniel, by Christ's own words, was a true Israelite. And so if that's the case, let's assume that the apostles were somewhere on that scale as well. Well, what that means is that, that, that they grew up in a culture of prayer. A true Israelite, which Nathaniel was, by Jesus' own words, he would have said the Shema, twice a day at least. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Maybe three times a day. Um, they had seven festivals a year. Some of them people would have walked hundreds of miles to attend. Some of them lasted a week. They were prayer-rich festivals. The average, the average Israelite couldn't, they couldn't drink a cup of wine without first saying a prayer. You know, blessings be to the Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Deuteronomy tells us in Deuteronomy, I think six, Moses is 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 about to the, the, the Israelites are about to go into the promised land. Moses isn't going with them; he's got to go up on a hill and and, and die. Deuteronomy is his last sort of speech. He's been with them for for decades, for generations in the wilderness, trying to beseech them and implore them back into God's presence. And his last message, the beginning of Deuteronomy 6, is the beginning of the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And and it goes on to say, you know, um, think of these things when you wake up in the morning. Think of these things as the last thing you think of when you go to sleep. When you walk along the road to go to work. When you come back. When you sit with your family uh, for an evening meal. Talk about these things. Impress them on your children. Write them on your hands and your forehead. You know, put them on the doorposts of your homes and on the gates of your houses. So the, these 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 Jewish men, they grew up in a culture of prayer. Their upbringing was based on prayer. Their history was prayer centric. They just grew up in this environment of prayer, and yet here they are. They've got Jesus alone. They've got this opportunity to ask him something important, something private. And they ask him, Rabbi, teach us to pray. But they knew about prayer. And also, you know, if you think about it, this this passage in Luke comes somewhere around the middle, the middle towards the second half of of, of the gospel, Jesus' mission. In Mark, it's recorded as it's much more towards the end of the mission. So these apostles had been with Christ for months, maybe years, and they'd seen a list of amazing signs and wonders that, you know, they'd seen Jesus do great miracles. They'd seen him uh, heal the sick and the blind. They'd seen him cast out demons. They'd seen him cleanse lepers. They'd seen him pick arguments with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and, and and silence the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They'd seen him preach fantastic sermons that that, that we still talk about today. Um, they'd even once seen him, <clears throat> as far as I know, once forgive somebody. Well, as a first century Jew, the only entity that could forgive sins was God. And so they'd seen astonishing signs and wonders. And so they've got they've got Jesus alone. The multitudes are away. Jesus has just finished praying and they can go and ask him. Why didn't they ask him, Rabbi, teach us to heal. Teach us to cast out demons. Teach us to cleanse lepers. Teach us to 
win arguments with Pharisees. Teach us to preach like you preach. Teach us to feed our families, let alone the 5,000. And they've got this opportunity to ask him something. And yet they ask him, teach us to pray. But they knew about prayer. Well, I put it to you that, that maybe they, they'd seen something in the way Jesus prayed. And maybe, maybe they'd seen that, yeah, okay, these great signs and wonders that, that it would be amazing if we could do and, and, and we you know, perhaps like to be able to do. But actually, is it possible that, that Jesus, that they'd seen that Jesus's prayer life was, was somehow foundational to his ministry, fundamental to the great works he did, that maybe, maybe it was his prayer life that preceded or precipitated these great signs and wonders. And maybe they, they'd worked out that, yeah, okay, if they wanted to do great healings and cleansings and casting outs, that what they first needed to get right and get square was their prayer life. And so when they've got this opportunity to ask Jesus for anything, seemingly, they ask him for the thing they know is, is fundamental or foundational to all the other great signs and wonders. Rabbi, teach us to pray. And that's what we're going to focus on in this series of films. Is, is coming back into that kind of power of prayer. And like Jesus, we're going to depend heavily on Scripture. Throughout Scripture, God makes a lot of promises. And in fact, um, you know, the, the word testament, I think, is relatively synonymous with the word covenant, that if we look at the sort of, you know, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, from a certain point of view, you're, you're looking at a legal document. It's full of promises and covenants. And so the, those promises, we know the big promises, if you like, the promises to Abraham, the promises to Moses, Noah, the promises to David and Solomon. And whilst, you know, they're, they're fantastic in the narrative and the story, they don't feel relevant to us today in our everyday lives. What we're going to look at is, I'm going to call them the little promises, but they're, they are so not little promises. They're, they're, they're significant today to us, to our everyday lives. And we're going to look at the ones that are relevant to us today. And to pray powerfully, we're going to hold God to his word. And that's a major premise of this series of films, is the idea of, of holding God to his word, of the promises he made throughout scripture. And why wouldn't we? An example would be if, if, if any of you are like, you know, guardians or you look after anybody or you maybe you have children and um, you might say to the, the, the person you look after, you know, look, look, if you um, if you tidy your room or if you get a good mark in the in the in the music exam or the dance exam, um, I'll, I'll buy you an ice cream. And we say that kind of thing. And then a bunch of weeks later, go by, you know, go by and we're at the beach and uh you know our child or our, the person we're looking after comes up and says hey mum dad can i have an ice cream and you're like oh come on you know like i've taken a day off work we've driven hundred a couple of hundred miles to be a couple of hours to be here um we've packed a picnic i've got the inflatable dinghy we're going to go swimming in a bit and now you want an ice cream and you're like well, well hang on a minute you, you know um you said if i get a good mark in the in the exam you'll buy me an ice cream and you go you're absolutely right. I'm so sorry. Yes, I did say that. And come on, let's go and get you the biggest ice cream. Yep, you're absolutely right. I do apologize. Well, that's scriptural. You know, um, Christ said in the Gospels, who of you, if your, if your son asked for a, a loaf, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for um, a serpent, would give him... No, if he asked for a fish, would give him a serpent? And then he says, and how much more will your heavenly father give to those who ask him so so the concept of holding god to his word and, and seeking out those those promises of god all that means is that we all we have to do is go through scripture and seek out hunt down those promises and then see how or if they can apply to our lives today and then hold god to his word i want to start in 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 jeremiah 29 12 
Now, Jeremiah 29, 12, God is recorded as saying to his people through the prophet Jeremiah, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Now, I know some people are going to argue, well, hang on a minute, you know, that's that's a, that was God speaking through Jeremiah to the people of Israel post-exile. So that's that's ancient history. That's that that was long ago coming out of exile. And others will say, no, 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 that's 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 an eschatological uh, verse. It's it's like God saying when at the end times when God will will put His law in everyone's mind and write His law on on the whole of humanity's heart. Then when you call on me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. It's it's, it's way off in the future. And some will say, no, it's way in the past. Well, I put it to you, if God's made that promise, be it in the past or the future, you know, as Christ said, nothing is impossible for God. If God said that promise through Jeremiah, you can hold God to that in your life now. And so what does that mean? Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. Pray like Jesus instructed us. And if you've not yet seen it, I've done a short film on how to pray in Jesus' own words. And it's six or seven minutes long. It's not, it's relatively challenging. And it's, it's how to pray as Jesus told us to pray. So have a look at that if you've not seen it. So back to Jeremiah. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me as Jesus told us. So we can look that up. And I will listen to you. Now that word listen is the Hebrew is Shema. Well, we, we covered Shema. Shema is the Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, translated, hear, O Israel, or listen, Israel. And But that word Shema is a Hebrew word. It's very much like Shalom or Hineni. It's a word that is rich with meaning, cultural meaning. And it gets translated as listen, but it means so much more than just listen. My understanding of Shema as a word is is it's it's a responsive listening it's a listen and act and and do what you're listening to respond act on what you're listening to on what you're hearing i think it's partly why you hear jesus in the gospels is recorded as saying you know let he who has ears to hear let him hear it's like it's like listen and respond and the word shema is listen and respond it's responsive and so now you've got a passage that says, when you call on me and come and pray to me, I will listen and respond to you. It's almost like the word listen has I will in it. Listen and I will. And so what that verse says to us is, is when we pray, you know, it's almost like we can say, you know, Father, you said through the prophet Jeremiah, you said, if I call on you and I come and pray to you, you will listen to me. So, Father, I'm praying to you as Jesus instructed. You know, I'm in my inner chamber. You know, I've, 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 I've set the environment up and I'm praying to you. Father, I hold you to your word. Listen to me. Let's look at another verse that supports that. Isaiah. Isaiah 58, 9. Simply says, now this is, this is Isaiah speaking of God. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. Now again, let's look at that word, here I am. It's, it's the, the Hebrew word is hineni. And so it gets translated as, here I am, like kind of like present. But again, it's like Shema and Shalom. It means so much more than just, here I am. It's the word where, you know, Moses um, going up the holy mountain and the voice of the Lord, Moses, Moses. And Moses responds, Hineni, Hineni, Lord, here I am. Again, it's a word, it, it, it's, it's an expression of total readiness. It's a readiness to give oneself, it's total availability. And so the word Hineni is, in fact, if you've listened to the latest, the last album by Leonard Cohen, the uh, You Want It Darker, it makes an appearance in that song, actually, You Want It Darker. It's 
Leonard Cohen says, um, Hineni, Hineni, I'm ready, my lord. Hineni, Hineni, I'm ready, my lord. There's kind of readiness in Hineni. If you like, um, imagine a, a general, um, you know, you've got the frontline tent, center of operations, frontline, and he, he he walks into the tent and there's all his staff and there's his sergeant major and as he walks into the, the tent and his sergeant major sort of stood there looking magnificent in readiness and the general says you know sergeant and the sergeant major immediately is like sir that sir isn't like you know yeah hello yeah present what implied in that is readiness responsiveness that word hineni is like let's get away from Let's get away from the military uh, example. Let's imagine like athletes. Um, it's the it's the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. It's the last event. It's the the hundred meters final. Uh, the whole world is watching. The athletes are on the track. It's the very final. They know exactly where they've got to be. The starter, you know, walks out and climbs up onto his ladder, and um, and the starter says, you know, athletes to your marks and they walk to their, their point on the track you know where their blocks are and they they get themselves down their hands and feet down and they're there and then the starter says get set and in that moment those athletes they've trained all their life for this moment their minds and bodies are poised for this one moment and in that moment get set they come up that's readiness because the next thing that's going to happen is on the starter pistol and they're gone and that word hineni, it's like that. It's it's readiness. It's available. It's poised. It's ready to spring into action. So knowing that, let's look again at Isaiah fifty eight nine. Then you will call on me. Sounds familiar. Sounds like Jeremiah. Then you will call on me, and the Lord will answer. Sounds again like Jeremiah. You will cry for help, and He will say. Hineni. I'm ready. I'm I'm poised. Here I am. Like not just not just here I am, but like here I am. Readiness. It's availability. God's promising availability, and you can hold God to his word. Let's look at a, a third place we're gonna look. The last place we're gonna look is in the Psalms. And I love that we're going in Jeremiah, Isaiah, Psalms, you know. We're really going in at the heavy end here. Jeremiah, uh, Psalm uh, 91.15 simply says, When you are in trouble, call out to me. I will answer and be there. When you are in trouble, call out to me. I will answer and be there. So you've got these, these, these three verses that seem very intertwinable. And what I'm suggesting is if you're going to pray, then one, pray as Jesus instructed. Two, pray into God's own promises in Scripture. Pray into the promises. And then three, hold God to his word. Now, I'm not suggesting here that we're, we're kind of demanding of God or we're trying to tell God what to do. We're not. But what we're doing is we're, we're kind of like the child with the ice cream. And so you end, it's going to look, it ends up looking something like this. Jeremiah 29, 12. Father, you said, if I call on you and come and pray to you, you will listen to me. Well, Father, I call on you. I'm praying to you like Jesus instructed, like 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 your son told me to. And you said you will listen. So Father, I hold you to your word. Listen to me. I'm calling out to you. Answer. Father, Psalm 9115, I'm calling out to you. Be there. And they're all sort those verses are all kind of saying the same thing. And so that's that's going to be the basis of all the rest of the film is that films is that sense that that you can ask God to listen to you you can hold God to his word now 
the reason I'm so passionate about this, this methodology, if you like, is, is a story. I remember years ago, I don't know if it's 10, 12 years ago, eight years ago, I, I'm, I'm not very good at time like that. I think maybe 2010, 2012. And, you know, I was, I was in my flat. Um, the lights were off. I was, I'd lit a candle, I think. And, um, you know, I was alone. And I'd had within me this, this yearning, this, this, this seeking deeper connection, this, this, if you like what we talked about at the beginning, this, this desire to pray. And it so often seemed to be, you know, stifled or I was hesitant or, or shy. But this, this yearning, I couldn't, I couldn't seem to get through. I could, I did, you know, and, and I guess if I'm honest, in my, in my mind, in my, in my imagination, I had a sort of mentally held shopping list. I don't remember what it was. Um, and I don't think that's particularly relevant, but I think we all sometimes have a, a sense of that. And sometimes we might have a sense that we should have a sense of that and we don't. So we don't know what to pray. I'm going to cover that in a later film. What to pray when you don't know what to pray. It's beautiful. But for now, we've got this mentally held shopping list and, and I was, I was in this state of, of, of this ache and this yearning. It, it was almost manifesting as a frustration. And, um, as I want to do, I, I kind of allowed the, the passion a little bit to bubble up. And I found myself just in this moment of frustration, suddenly kind of like blurting out, Oh God, just listen to me. Well, as that came out, there was this, this moment of instantly, it, it was as if the very room I was in and beyond that, the, 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 the very night sky outside, the, 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 you know, the whole atmosphere, the buildings, the bricks, the furniture, it was as if all of that, as I, as I said, you know, listen to me, it was as if it all turned. In this this split second, this 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 revelation or moment of stark reality, everything turned, and and suddenly, in a heartbeat, I felt profoundly listened to, and and it was a shock. It, it was it was a shock that that, that it, it silenced me and I'm also vaguely aware that if I if I think of that sort of you know the 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 held in the mind shopping list that there was this this sense of um unease about that that I, I you know suddenly like I'm really being listened to it was suddenly like oh um I was embarrassed if that's the right word it was like oh um uh, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Um, um, nothing. Sorry to bother you. And and it was like all of any of those desires, any of those frustrations, any of those things I, I thought I was taking into that space, they were gone. If I, it, it was almost as if the desire, the yearning to f for that outreach, it was almost as if the being listened to in that moment, initially was and had been the answer I, I, I'd always been looking for. That in that moment, it was all satisfied. And what I thought I'd brought was, I was ashamed of it, or I was not sure quite the right word, but it, it was irrelevant. And that, that initial sense of, of, of wonder at being listened to and the silence that threw me into that, that kind of lasted for months and it sort of lasted for years. The sense of being listened to, like every time I revisited that space, that became my, my prayer. My prayer became, you know, God, listen to me. And the moment I did, I'd have this sense of being listened to straight away. And that went on for a couple of years at least. And what I want to look at is what that foundation would do, what that foundation did to me. It, what that foundation, that sense of I'm really being listened to, what it changes, 
that list into because that list becomes irrelevant. And it's a bit like that that saying, you know, be careful what you ask for, you might just get it. It's like, if you know, if you come to know you're being listened to, it changes what you think you want to pray for. It, it, it takes you deeper into a meditation, deeper into a sense of responsibility. And so this series of films is that very journey. But I wasn't particularly familiar with scripture way back then. In fact, I wasn't at all. I became passionate about scripture almost as a result of that. And what I found in becoming that passionate was there was loads of this and it's all available and it's all uh, applicable, strongly applicable now, today, to us. And, you know, as I said, we're not, we're not here trying to tell God what to do. That's not, that's not the aim of this, but rather we're looking to, with an understanding of God's promises and then covenant style, holding God to his word and praying into the promises of God and from the promises of God and to some degree with some of them praying for the promises of God. You said this, I pray for that. You're praying for the very thing God promised and that becomes beautiful and that becomes so powerful. So the next film I'm going to do is with this, with this film, we've taken one precept of, of, of scripture, which is, um, God has promised to listen and respond. We're going to take that and we're going to evolve on top of that. So we're going to take that foundation and we're going to build. And then each film is going to build on those foundations. And this one foundation of Jeremiah 29, 12 is, is, is key. The next film, we're going to take two separate precepts. One is, one is, scripture and verses that talk about authority your authority the authority that is given to us and how we can take hold of that take custody of that and incorporate that in our prayer life and layer it on top of listen and respond and the second one we're going to take the second precept is tenacity and for the next film we're going to be it's i think it's mostly christ's centric it's jesus's own words much of the time um and in a way that there's a loveliness to that because from scripture we're going to be using Jesus's own words to hold God to his word. Now that already sounds powerful. Using Jesus's own words to hold God to his word. There's responsibility in that. There's response in that. So that's, that's the next film. In the meantime, because I've not made that film, in the meantime, um, I, I, w- I would implore you, ask God to honour his promises. Ask him to listen and see how that changes you in your relationship with your own prayer life. See how that, see how that makes you reevaluate just that, that tiny beginning of your own prayer life. God promises over and over to listen to you. Hold him to that. And then see how that, that change of relationship also rouses, stirs your sense of of responsibility. For me, it manifests in the sense of, if you like, changing the shopping list. That became responsible not just whimsical and so that's what we're going to do in the meantime i I would ask you if you if you've if you've seen value in this message and got anything from this and i'm assuming because you got to the end you, you probably have then please you know subscribe hit the bell like share um not because i i care at all about likes and shares and thumbs up and nonsense i i i don't but I do care about this message. And I think that we've got something here we can build on. So do your bit to support that. And obviously if you subscribe and hit the bell, then when I release the next film in this series of holding God to his word, you'll know straight away. Um, and, and I like the idea of that. So, um, 
See you next time.